And now we have David Grealish with the development of the third tier of personal computing. Thanks, David. Thanks. And, uh, and more. So, so my title is Some General Computer History and the Evolution, De-Evolution, Establishment of the Third Tier in Personal Computing. So uh, I'm David Grealish, and uh, my site is my main site is classiccomputing.com, where I sometimes blog and I produce audio and video podcasts, and I've done a few interviews too. And our, my main podcasting vehicle is along with uh, Karen Vince and Earl Evans on Retro Computing Roundtable. So uh, first, I want to start off by establishing my Apple II credentials. <laughs> so and I attended the Venture Computer Festival in California at the Computer History Museum in Mountain View in 2006. And it was Apple's 30th anniversary, so uh, Waz was there, some of the early Apple um, founders, starters, starters, whatever. So this is him signing my replica one, which I brought along too. And signing my copy of IWAS. <laughs> All right. So I'm a big fan of Apple. I may not have as much history in the Apple II specifically, but uh, love Waz. So now I just want to play something. This is a quick and fun, uh, interesting commercial from 1993 that I like to start off with. Have you ever borrowed a book from thousands of miles away across the country? You ever remember this? Yep. Without stopping for directions. It is more set by someone of facts. From the beach. And the company that will bring it to you. I use facts from the beach. So I'll move along and tell you a little bit about myself and my computer history. So the first personal computer I ever really used was an Apple II Plus, and it was in college. The two drives, just like that. But it was not the first computer I ever owned. So um, I actually had a Commodore 64. I got it very late in its run, so like 1986. And all I ever owned was the computer. I never had a disk drive or display, cassette, anything. So all I could do is kind of plug it in and type on basic and leave it on for days at a time. I never really got to play any games or anything too much fun with it that, that sense. So what I consider the first real computer I ever had was my Apple Lisa I acquired in late 1989. This is a Lisa 2, if you're not familiar with that. Um, I bought mine from Sunry Marketing, and so it was actually a Mac that, you know, it was a Lisa 2 that ran the Mac Works Plus, it was called. For all practical purposes, it was a Mac Plus, um, but it didn't have a sound chip. So anything that directly addressed sound like a Mac would, it would crash it. But it was great otherwise. And my background was in desktop publishing. So that's what I used. Uh, let's see. Oh, one thing about the least. So in me getting started in computer history, this was one of the sort of three catalysts that got me interested in the hobby. So I was very fascinated with this machine. And that turned into a fascination with Apple's history, you know, Mac's history, and Apple's history, and then personal computer history, and then and so on. It kept growing. So a second influence was this TV show that Carrington will especially appreciate, some other Canadians, called Bits and Bites. So um, I joined, shortly after I joined the Army, um, I had to do like mandatory training, if you will, go to the library on public and watch videos and stuff, and I chose this. And so it was like a, a, a you know, fun thing for me to watch this because I was already interested in computer history. So someone has put this entire show now on YouTube, so you can watch it, I highly recommend it. Um, was it a training program or interviews? No, it was like a, um, Reviews? It was a public uh, television sort of thing, just introducing computers to people. And they had, you know, Apple II and Commodore and Atari and TRS-80. Um, and then, you know, what, what, how's it work and how you use them and everything. So it's a great, you know, computer history time capsule now. Um, and where, where can you find that show? On YouTube. Do, do a search for bits and bytes. And uh, the very first one I put up, and then uh, they also must put them all up. So that's really, really great. Um, so a third catalyst for me was this book called Hackers by Stephen Levy. That's a scan of my actual copy my brother gave me before I went off as an army, so before I deployed to Germany for my first duty station. So very influential, highly recommend it. And then I put up here some other books that were early ones for me that really just kept inspiring me to be interested in computer history. Bit, bit by bit, digital delivery a little bit harder to come by. Actually, this one's online, I'm pretty sure now. I've got Atari archives. 
So moving along. Um, so I was in the Army. I lived in Germany. I got married. Uh, you know, other stuff going on in my life. But my interest in computer history, just I, I read as much as I could about it. I, I thought about it would be kind of cool to maybe collect computers. No one's doing that. So I had an idea in sort of late 1992, I saw in Germany, that maybe I would start a club and maybe I could post a newsletter and start collecting uh, computers. I didn't think it was very practical until I was deployed back to the United States. So, so, so anyway, so I created, I came up with the name the Historical Computer Society because I thought it sounded serious and <laughs> professional. You know, I wanted to grow into a legitimate organization, nonprofit, so on uh, one day. So that's me, still in the Army. This is actually in El Paso, Texas, not in Germany. I have a picture of me there. Um, so that, yeah, that picture's from, what, 1993, I guess. So that's so late 1992. Anyway, then we deployed back to uh, my last two stations at Fort uh, Bliss, El Paso, Texas, and I started the Historical Computer Society in April of 1993. Here's some pictures of me after uh, I lived there a while and started collecting computers. So here's like my Apple II Plus and the Osborne, and this is a the original compact portable IBM PC down here, with a big hard drive underneath it. This is an NEC APC, it's called, you know, old Macintosh. Um, <laughs> Convergent Technologies work slate, which I still have. Um, so I officially launched the club. Good thing I made notes. <laughs> I officially launched the club. I started collecting computers regularly, and I started getting the word out about my club and this newsletter. And I, I, I was on CompuServe, so I used CompuServe and AOL Passifies, and then later on finding the internet. So what I started as the official voice of the group, primary communications tool, was this newsletter called Historic Rebrew. And that's the first issue, which I did the whole thing, because I didn't have anybody, any contributors at that point. So this came out in August, uh, it's the August, September issue, 1993. Uh, the name is a play on the term homebrew. Before you can buy computers, you have to homebrew a computer. You have a famous uh, user group in California, it's called Homebrew Computer Club. Um, you know the story, right? Uh, Steve Jobs, who wants to shut off the Apple one there. So that's that first issue. Um, I'm not here to tell this whole story, so um, over time I did nine of them. So here's the nine, the nine different ones. Um, you know, they got more and more professional, started doing two color um, covers. Um, Steve Weyrich had a three part series on the beginnings of the Apple II. Um, see, right here, these three issues are included. And uh, it got pretty, you know, it's pretty prominent. They got pretty professional by this last one. I interviewed Ed Roberts, if anyone knows who he is. The creator of the Mitz Altair, so that was a pretty neat thing in that last issue. So, um, moving along, I ultimately decided to change the name. I wanted to try to make it go more mainstream. So, classic computing, instantly people would know what that is. Like, so, I changed the name to Classic Computing Zine <coughs> or Magazine, and I had the covers um, professionally printed at a print shop, and, uh, and then it ran out of money, and I never, it never happened. Everything stopped for 14, 15 years. So um, let's see. So just move on here. So basically, I can talk more about this later. But I, you know, I published a book last year. I did a Kickstarter campaign. The complete historically brewed contains you know on all nine issues of my newsletter. So I finally didn't get into people's hands again. I think it's still you know all the stories are there. It's history. It doesn't get old. Um, and then I also took that last. This is basically historically brewed ten. Classic beauty one, and I finished it too. To go along with this now it's like a bundle by myself. So I have these for sale. All right, so now we're going to move along. I want to, I'm going to try to keep this at 30 minutes, so I think we're doing good. So basically, I just want to spend a couple of minutes to talk about general computer history, which is basically broken down into four generations. Forgive me if you already know this, but um, the first generation is defined by the vacuum tube. And that's, so on the left here, you have a close-up of one of the panels of the ENIAC. And everyone familiar with the ENIAC? It was uh, meant to... Um, Calculate uh, anti-aircraft trajectories for World War II. It wasn't actually completed until 1946 after the war ended, but it was a huge success in any case. It had approximately 18,000 vacuum tubes. And when it was in operation, one would burn out approximately every 30 seconds. But they designed it in such a way so every one of these panels you know, could be pulled out and instantly they have another one ready to plug in, and then later they can go find the bad tube, test it, do whatever. So here's another um, look at the ENIAC. It was not programmed in the sense of, uh, you had to program the machine through wiring to make it do something, and then it did that for a while. Uh, on the right-hand side is a, uh, so we had two gentlemen named Eckert and Mockley, who for the United States Army made this computer. 
And then they went off to launch the first American Computer Corporation. And uh, I always forget the name of that company, but basically it became UNIVAC, the name of the company. The first computer is the UNIVAC 1, which the United States Census Bureau purchased. So, um, all right. So then you have the second generation, which is defined by the transistor. And that's a reproduction of the transistor there, the very first one. And then on the right is what my research I tells was generally considered the first commercial fully transistorized computer, the IBM 608 from uh, 1957. And, you know, anytime you see a picture like that, obviously that's not the entire computer. I mean, that, that's probably the main CPU and all that, but it's going to have other things that go along with it. I always add this slide. Uh, one of my favorite um, documentaries is, is a, something that came out 20 years ago called Machine that Changed the World. I have a clip for it later. And uh, you can watch that free online. It's really excellent. And, uh, and they talk about a part in there after the second generation called the tyranny of numbers. And essentially, I wrote this down because I, I can say it better when I write it down. Basically, what it was is that the, the transistor replaced the vacuum tube. And so it made a huge reduction in size and heat. And so ultimately, <laughs> It, uh, but ultimately became an engineering nightmare because even though it, it it made a huge advancement in computer technology, um, people could theoretically design all kinds of you know crazy complex computers with transistors on paper, but there became a, uh, a limitation of what was humanly possible to wire, and that's what's called the tyranny of numbers. It, so the computing industry kind of ran up against the wall, the transistor, because you know you have to wire every one of those things together. And this is actually a picture of a computer from the Computer History Museum. And they just sent a close up above. There's actually a bunch of capacitors and stuff in that other picture. Oh, you know what? Please ask questions if you like, anytime. So the third generation is defined by the integrated circuit, which again pushed the computer industry forward, you know, in, in great leaps. So where you had individual transistors, now you have, you know, hundreds, thousands of transistors on one little teeny chip. Um, in the middle top there is an example of what's arguably the first mini computer, the uh, Digital Equipment Corporation, the DEC PDP-8 from 1965. Sometimes referred to as the straight eight. There were different ones going forward. And the southern one here to the right is the Data General Nova 3. This is a much later example and a smaller example of a mini computer, um, 1975. So now we come to the current generation of computing. Uh, and it's defined by the microprocessor. Um, so at the top there, you have the Intel 8080, which are, you know, launched the personal computer industry with the, the NITS Altair and Insi and some of those other S100 computers. And then this one, this one's the 8080A. So this is what the first IBM PC you know, had to do with it. And of course, the beloved Nuance Technology 6502, which the Apple II, Commodore, Atari used. Uh, there's kind of a, um, a misconception that people have that you know computers got smaller and smaller and smaller, and so it was only it was only logical that a personal computer rose out of the, the constant downsizing of computers, and uh, it didn't really because they didn't use microprocessors. The personal computer rose out of um, hobbyists and, and this, you know, this made personal computing possible. Here's some example of uh, microcomputers that are called. Personal computers. So, uh, processor technology, Sol, that's 100 computer, that's a SX64, just some random ones, a uh, North Star Horizon, for side the MPC, and of course, we all know what that is. So, I have a short clip from that documentary. Spark in Silicon Valley, the electronics capital of the world. A revolution was underway. Every year, Engineers vied with each other to stuff more and more electronic circuitry onto tiny wafers of silicon. Computers which once filled a room have been reduced to the size of a refrigerator. And in 1971, the silicon wizards went a step further, putting the main circuitry of a computer on a chip. A chip which could be mass produced a microprocessor had the power to totally change the economics of computing. Computers need no longer be priceless objects. Microprocessors, if mass-produced, could become cheap enough to be disposable. 
I had one uh, case where I was being interviewed by somebody from a magazine who kept asking questions about testing. But I realized after this questioning went on for a while that they weren't really talking about testing, they were talking about repair. And they had the idea that somehow somebody was going to have to to take their soldering iron and go down inside the chip and try to move wires around. And then uh, once I realized what they were really asking, I said, oh, no, it's not like that at all. It's like a light bulb. When it burns out, you unplug it and you throw it in the garbage and plug in a new one. And they were just dumbfounded at the idea that a computer could be so inexpensive you'd think about throwing it away. But in the mid-70s, corporate giants like IBM were not convinced that ordinary people would ever want to buy computers, even if they were small machines. <laughs> Seemingly unaware of the brilliant work of Xerox Park, they saw their customers as scientific and business institutions. There was a group of technical people on the fringes of the computer establishment, however, who desperately wanted their own computers. Technical hobbyists who had used computers at universities and knew their remarkable versatility. Before the microprocessor, their dream seemed absurd. Now, perhaps, things would change. In January 1975, the front cover of Popular Electronics featured a computer kit called the Altair for less than $500. The Altair had to be assembled by hand, but at its heart was a microprocessor. If people did want to own a computer, here, finally, was an opportunity. An opportunity, it turned out, that thousands of people had been waiting for. And what happened was all this pent-up demand, a sort of latent understanding everybody had of what computers could do, suddenly was allowed to burst forth. <laughs> people go all night to get their computer kits. And why do people read the popular mechanics magazines? Because they dream of all the things they could do if. And suddenly here was a new if. If only I had this computer, I could keep track of everything. I could learn everything. I could be creative in every possible way. And, uh, and so it began. For technical hobbyists, it was a dream come true. No, they could have their own computer. Clubs of enthusiasts grew up all over America, like the Homebrew Computer Club in San Francisco, where members showed off what their homebrew computers could do. From these modest beginnings came a series of startup companies selling parts for the Altair and soon, whole computers. By 1976, there were enough of them to hold a convention in Atlantic City. Off in a corner of the convention hall were a group of raggedy-looking guys selling circuit boards. Two of them would become synonymous with a personal computer, Steve Jobs and Stephen Wozniak. I can watch the whole thing, but... <laughs> So, you know, on those, those old tiers and S100 machines, about a third of the case is power supply. That big fan, you know, it keeps on sounds like a jet engine. So there's the first issue of Power Electronics, the well, first one called here, January 1975. Um, and then here's an example of an um, original Altair in the 8800B, a later model. If you notice, this does not look like this. This was a mock up of the actual prototype. The prototype was shipped on a railroad freight deal in 1975. To pop out Trans magazine for so they could take pictures of the inside and all that good stuff, the write up, and it was lost forever. It's never been found. So, uh, and Roberts <laughs> ultimately redesigned it and then, you know, got one off to him for the picture and all that stuff. And uh, here's just another image of the Homebrew Computer Club, and uh, which was held at, um, started in March 1975, it was held at the Community Computer Center in Menlo Park, California, the Greater San Francisco Bay. And then there's first newsletter. This is Slack, though. What's that? This is SPAC, Stanford Planetary Accelerator is where this is. Okay. And that's where most of the history is. Is where that might be the room is. Okay. Right. The, 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 the auditorium. Maybe that might be the modern name of it now or something. No, I mean, I go to a computer club meeting there every month. Oh, uh, okay. I'll double check that. I mean, I believe you. Well, no, they may have started. Uh, well, 
was called then, maybe, or something. No, they may have started in another venue. I got you, but, but the picture is, is Panofsky Hall at Stanford Linear Accelerator. Okay. I've got some pictures. I think I've still got them on my computer. I made a presentation. Oh, I can't change it while I'm sitting here. No, thank you. I don't want to. I, want to I like to say things what they are, you know, with the, with the pictures. So, all right, so moving along. I'm going to talk about something I call the three tiers of personal computing. So we learned all about the basic, you know, computer history, the generations. So to start, um, we'll talk about first tier. So basically the first tier was the desktop personal computer. And uh, these are three significant ones. I'll have to tell you about one. But all three of these were released in 1977. These are arguably the first consumer computers where you know, regular people could go and buy a box and take it home and open the box and, you know, and hook it up and do something with it. So you had the TRS-80 Model 1, the Commodore PET, and then, of course, the Apple II. Can anyone tell me what order these were announced? Or, this, is, this is where it gets a little gray, but I'll use the term were introduced in 1977. Anybody want to? Go ahead. I think I maybe have the dates when it actually shipped. Yeah, but the Apple II before it came out in May of 1977. Well, you're close. This is what I have is um, the Apple II actually gets credit as the first. So April and then October for the pet and November for the TR Safety Model 1. But you know, just these dates are good kind of. I think that's per Wikipedia. Trouble is that announcement and shipping dates were two different things. Right, right. And this is something I should work on on my presentation. Because <laughs> I did this information some time ago. So I think I meant, I think that's what I found that they shipped. Because that would kind of match what you're I saying close. In, in June. In okay. All right. So they made their introductory. Sorry. I, I graduated high school in 76. Uh -huh. I remember 77 coming back and talking to my high school. And they would, I consulted with them on what to do to the day. And uh, they decided to wait another two years because it, it was just a horse race for them. They yeah. Didn't to, they didn't want to buy into it until they understood which one would have the educational software they need. Sure. And being fair, I mean, even, you know, even what we know of the Apple II. You, Right away when it first came out, there's little you could really do with it, unless you knew how to just start programming and stuff. So the first tier, desktop computing. So now the second tier, which uh, is basically portable computing, right? Makes sense. Got desktops first. So portable computers were uh, defined initially by what were kind of lovingly called uh, luggables, and there's been there's been some other ones before the Osborne, but generally speaking, the Osborne one. In 1981, this is generally considered the first commercial and commercially successful uh, portable computer, luggable computer. And luggable defined because at that time they were fitting on airline seats. Exactly. That's why they were shaped this way as well, because they, you could tr travel with them. This is the Compact Portable one, just called Compact Portable. But uh, so you can see it's the same sort of shape and stuff. But that started that company. Of course, what was very significant about this machine is this is the very first 100%. IBM compatible. So that broke IBM's hold on, on that market, and then the clone market rose up around it. So first you have what were called Legables, and then next, basically, laptops started to appear by the mid to late 1980s. And um, and then, of course, we, we call them notebooks now, too. And uh, yeah, they look different now, and uh, they're lighter and thinner and smaller, and you know, you have your you got a GUI, so you have a trackpad, and so on. But generally speaking, what we use right now is not too far from that. So what, what was defined 25 years ago, we're still essentially using. So now the third tier. This is where it gets a little more interesting. There's been a struggle to define this third tier for probably about 25 years or so. So first I'm going to point out to a couple of some failures, arguably. It doesn't mean there weren't some successes here. But um, these are what we call you know, handhelds or, or pocket computers. Um, the bottom left here, you have the Atari portfolio, and uh, that came out in 1989. Then the HP 95LX, which uh, now both of those actually ran DOS, 
and the HP could run Lotus 123. And this one's a slightly later one, 1992, which is a Zeos Pocket PC. Anyone remember Zeos? It used to be all over Computer Shopper and stuff. Um, but the reason I say, I mean, some of these sold pretty well, but not in any large numbers. And the reason they were sort of failures is they were in no way a um, an alternative to you know a, a real computer, a desktop or a laptop. They didn't fulfill that, you know that. Yeah, you know, right now a desktop and laptop are equally billed for the most part, and so this didn't fulfill a third tier that could do the, many of the same things. So next we move along to what was called a personal digital assistant, and if you remember this from the <laughs> set of facts on the beach, and I have one. I would have loved the rod. I usually do bring it, but not when I have to fly on the road. Uh, good old John Scully of Apple Computer coined the term PDA, personal digital assistant. And of course, that's the original Apple Newton there from 1993. These are all from 1993, by the way. Um, actually, if you look into the history of the, the Knowledge Navigator or the Newton, you know, it, even it didn't really live up to what they had initially were designing and intending. They rushed it out because they felt like that was the future of Apple, the direction they wanted to go in. So, um, and pretty much these were failures. They didn't they didn't sell very well. They they cost a lot of money. Um, Let's see, I'll just tell you more about them. The middle one is a uh, Tandy uh, Zoomer made by Casio. Casio had another variation of it. It ran Zeos, or Geos, rather, sorry. And then this is the AT&T EO Personal Communicator, which ran the pinpoint operating system, all, all pin computers. And you could actually put a cell phone on that one. It actually had a, has a real handset sort of cell phone. So basically what happened is, is as there's a big push, now of course with the Newton, you know, it got really mocked in the in the media and stuff about handwriting recognition. That didn't help it very much, which arguably it by by the 2.0 2 operating system, it was pretty decent. But you know, it got lambasted by uh, what was the Doomsbury cartoon and, and other stuff. So really what happened to this third tier is it was just never really accepted as a as a third alternative to desktops or laptops. And uh, so basically, they sort of got humbled, and and this category was was defined by what are called organizers. With the most uh, successful one being this, the Palm Pilot. So just real quick, that is a uh, um, went blank here, Scion 3A. Anyone remember that one? And then the middle is a Sharp Wizard from about 1994, and of course uh, the original Palm Pilot. So actually, I think this is the this is when U.S. Robotics bought them. Of course, the first one was made by Palm, and it was a pilot. But this ultimately became the successful third tier, if you will, because it it was very simple, smaller, light, cheap compared to like what a Newton was or whatever. It did very few things, but it did them very well. It, you know, your contact list, your calendar, your appointments, and um, what am I missing? That's it, right? Dates, kind of, you didn't have a phone with it. One thing I used to sort of, uh, when I did this presentation about the third tier, it's kind of involved in stuff. I kind of used to say that, you know, it seemed logical that if you look at a magazine from about 1994, a Mac Week or something like that, you'll see that people, one of the biggest things they would say, I would, I want on my Newton was a cell phone. Then, it, then I'd have everything on it. So it seemed logical the, the computer might become the phone one day. But actually, it happened in reverse. So the phone ultimately became a real computer. Um, some people say that these these were, or that one was the first smartphone. So this is why I call it a potential third tier. Um, the one on the left is by IBM and Bell South called the Simon. It came out in 1984. It was really limited where you could get it and it's almost a thousand dollars. So it was not a big success. And then it did not have any kind of email or any of that stuff. It just had a touch interface and like there's a PDA phone. Um, the middle one is arguably the first smartphone because it had internet capability. Um, it's from 1986. It's a the Nokia 9000 communicator. Very expensive, you know, limited. And then this was uh, Trio's first um, smartphone. I don't even know if they were called that. Were they in 2002? I don't know if we had that term yet. I guess we might have by then. So this was a PDA phone, a Palm phone, but it, it had, you know, email and, and real basic web. So moving along then, what I've defined is what I feel is the true third tier where we are today was the introduction of the iPhone in 2007. And, and that's a big debate there. But the reason I say the iPhone, because um, it had a, a 
a multi-touch, you know, touch interface. It had a true desktop quality email client and web browser. So highly limited compared to laptop or desktop, but you could do those basic things on it that you could on this or on a desktop. Uh, and then of course later on you got third party apps. So it's even more like a real computer, though arguably limited, right? You can't do everything on your iPad or iPhone, you can do it on your computer. And then of course basically you have Android and WebOS and some other ones. But it was a real, you know, a real third tier computer in most of any ways that mattered. Do you have a comment or a question? Yes. And this is the generation of stuff that sold. I mean, the, the business redefined and generated a whole new um, environment to work in. Yeah, in my opinion. Yeah. I mean, absolutely right. The iPhone was groundbreaking and changed everything. So, because we had all, you know, uh, you haven't heard me mention the Blackberry, and the Blackberry deserves tons of credit for it, it absolutely was a great platform as an email client. But very poor in the web part of it and a lot of other ways. But so it, it was a smartphone, but not in what I call this third tier, you know, of a real true full on computer, you know, handheld. So then how do we define, you know, the iPad or, you know, laptops that are coming, sorry, tablets that are coming up? Are they, are they, they're just, I kind of think they're extensions of the third tier. I don't know if I'd call them a fourth tier, but they're not phones, so they're not handheld. Something to think about, and that's it. Anyone have any other questions? What is the fourth tier? <laughs> I mean, I had a slide with that on it, then I took it away. I don't know. I was gonna I just ask the question and have maybe a quick discussion. Do, do you have any ideas? I, I debated whether the ta you know the the tablet market is that somehow going to be a fourth tier? Maybe if it evolves more, because you know, no disrespect to I love my iPad, but it's kind of a big iPhone, right? So it is sort of limited in a lot of ways. Yeah, Google Glasses. Because right now you're still requiring touch. We think of touch is cool. Yeah. But the next generation is no touch required. Yeah. Can you imagine when you know when you walk around and people are talking on their Bluetooth? Yeah, and you think, oh, maybe they're talking to me. Oh, they're on their dumb Bluetooth. Can you imagine when people are walking around with those things? <laughs> like, oh yeah, hey, <laughs> they're walking around. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> um, so real quick, oh whoops, let me mirror my display. So this is my website, classiccomputing.com, and you can link off to uh, RCR podcast or some of my other ones. But um, if you if you go down to the archives here, I have an article too, which goes a little more. Oh, you know what? I think it was at the bottom there. Wasn't it? Oh, here it is. Third tier personal computing. So this article kind of. It's a little different than my talk, but it kind of goes into into this the whole discussion of the third tier and stuff too. This is pretty good. And if you're interested, you know, I interviewed John Scully recently, and I've interviewed a few other people, and I I wrote these articles about should Apple have a public venue and sort of museum at that new campus they're going to be building, and that pretty cool. I'd love to hear your comments if you have any about it. So any other questions? That I think the next generation, the only thing it's going to stop it is. When people integrate whatever it is into their lives, uh, they're going to be distracted by it as they try to do day to day things. You know, first time someone's got the new Google Glass or something the equivalent, yeah, has to fire around the telephone pole, right? The society's going to have to figure out how to address stuff like that, yeah, because it is kind of intrusive in a lot of ways. And I love discussions of the future as much as I love the past, too. I, think I know we, we've had some in the show, not so much it's intrusive, but distracting. Yeah, it's a problem already. Uh, Earl? That's what I was going to say. Haven't we already kind of begun to assimilate the technology? I mean, there was a lot of discussion. Are cell phones too distracting? Mm -hmm. Right. Should people be talking on a cell phone in a public venue? Well, yeah, and, at some point, we got to kind of get, get away from it. Well, and society's already said you don't need that in the car unless there's certain certain restrictions. Uh, because of safety issues. Right, right. right. Go ahead. That's a uh, I like science fiction, and if you're interested in a uh, really interesting conception of, of, of the overlap of virtual and real world, he was named by Bernard Lindbergh. Oh. And uh, he, has, he has people wandering around wired, and one of, 
one of the things the kids have to do before they graduate is they have to go into a place that is not fire and survive for a while and actually accomplish something. It's good to take the thing and not. I think I mentioned the singularity at first, but. <laughs> uh, so one last thing, so basically this book was $27 and I, $5 for the my zine, but I, I recently put it together as a combo package for $25, but I'm selling it here for $20. So I got like 12 left if anybody wants one. So thank you very much.